I'm excited to be here, excited to be talking to you. Um, uh, why are we having this conversation? Uh, you know, uh, scooters uh, have descended recently on Detroit, uh, but we're not really here to talk about scooters. Uh, we're, talk, we're here to talk about being in a moment, and I don't know if we all recognize we're in that moment. Um, we've had a moment like this, probably not in our lifetimes, uh, but we had it um, at, the, at the turn of the last century, a moment that I think is very much like this moment, where we had a whole system of transportation um, that, was pretty, uh, that was pretty amazing, pretty robust, um, you know, look at this picture. Can you see a single automobile, right? So not much more than 10 years later, right? Can you see a single horse? You know, it happened that fast before there was the internet. You know, before most people lived in cities, we had this amazing, um, this amazingly rapid transformation. And, and uh, you know, uh, who knows? Uh, if the people who were promoting cars at the time or promoting this new transportation thought it was a success, the thing they were trying to solve in New York was a horse poop problem, right? And so I think it worked for that. Uh, the question is, does it really work uh, for a lot of other things? If you had a single uh, word to describe what our current transportation system looks like, and there's a lot of things you use, people use to describe it depending on if you're stuck in traffic or, or, or late for work and the bus isn't coming. But inefficient would be a word that would describe it, right? It's, uh, it's expensive. It's costly in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of space, in terms of how much carbon gets emitted, in terms of how much other pollution. You know, it's the leading cause of asthma, right? And it's regressive. It's made getting around really regressive, meaning it, it, the poorer you are, the more of your income you're spending to try to use transportation. Um, and, and we seem to have been OK accepting the fact that cars, on average, are parked 95% of the time and only driven 5% of the time. Yet for many households, it's the largest single purchase they'll ever make, or maybe the second largest, you know, behind perhaps buying a house if they're ever lucky enough to do that. And we have six to nine parking spaces for each and every automobile in America. So it's a, it's a huge waste of space. 25 to 30% of every city's land, the publicly owned land, is given over to the space for these vehicles to move around in and to park in. So what's happened is, in part because of technology, in part because here in the US, we're kind of unique in having this transportation system that's so very wasteful. In other countries, automobiles might be operating, but not in the way we, they're operating in the US. Lots of private sector actors, fueled by um, venture capital money in many cases, are trying to capitalize on those inefficiencies. They're like, oh, here's a perfect example of a market failure. We can do it better. We can do it uh, cheaper, we can fill gaps, um, and we can bring new services online that we think people will really want to use. Um, so, you know, is that, you know, what do we think about that? Cars are, are pretty sticky. You know, if you have a car, it turns out you make almost all your trips by car, whatever the kinds of trips they are, because to you it seems like the marginal cost of using your car is zero, you know? You're not thinking about, oh, what did the car cost? What's insurance cost? What's gas cost? What's maintenance cost? You might think about what parking costs if you have to actually pay to park somewhere. Uh, but other than that, you're thinking it's pretty much free. Whereas if you don't have a car, or if there are fewer cars than there are adult drivers in your house, you're probably doing a lot of other things. You're walking for more of your trips. You're taking uh, uh, other modes of transportation. You're on the bus more. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S., whatever the distance, you know, you're taking, you're taking car trips. For example, um, in the U.S., more than 50% uh, of all the trips that are, uh, that are taken are three miles or less. 
and yet 75% of those trips are taken by automobile. Even for trips that are just a mile, half of those are taken by car, right? And that's, that's pretty inefficient. Compared to the rest of the, U, uh, of the world, we take twice as many car trips at every distance as, as people do everywhere else in the world. Um, so cars, um, cars make it hard for other things to work. Before there were cars, uh, you know, there was, there was public transit. Before cars were ever here, they were, they were originally horse-drawn, but, uh, but then they became electric. And uh, one of the biggest uh, transit networks in the whole country was here in the city of Detroit. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was and still is the best option for affordable and sustainable mobility because it carries so many people and it does so efficiently. Uh, there were more than 800 miles of track, 200 miles just in the city of Detroit alone. Uh, and it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty amazing. If you think about uh, the changes Detroit has gone through, um, through much of the, the, the last century, you know, one of the things people talk a lot about is how this used to be a city of, a, of almost 2 million people, 1.85 million people, um, and that there's, 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 uh, there's under 700,000 people today. But in terms of the transit network, uh, it, it, it was much more decimated. You know, what we have now is a pale shadow, a tiny fraction of what we used to have. Um, and, uh, and until the streetcar, uh, the Q line, opened just a couple years ago, Detroit was the uh, largest city in the U.S. without a fixed guide ray, uh, rail system of any kind. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's become the case in Detroit and in actually a lot of other cities that bus transportation has become uh, the, the bigger thing. And, and it, it's not for lack of need that we don't have tran uh, better transportation here. I mean, one of the weirdest things uh, that I'll talk a little bit about is how, uh, how much the region uh, is not coming together around transportation. And when you ask yourself why that might be, you don't have to look very far uh, to see the, the roots that lie in racial discrimination. This is a map you probably have seen before. It's kind of a famous map. Every city has one of these. Uh, but uh, uh, but when, people, when people think about redlining, they think about uh, you know, this, this, uh, this map of discrimination from the 1930s, they think, oh, that was in the past. But in almost every neighborhood, um, St. Louis, in Baltimore, in Detroit, in lots of other cities, that, that uh, that map of redlining uh, you know, looks very much like how people of different incomes and race are distributed across the cities today. Uh, and, and it wasn't just redlining. We had uh, urban renewal that actively destroyed a lot of intact uh, uh, African-American neighborhoods. We had school segregation. Um, so you know, in Detroit and in a lot of other cities, there is this history. And it's reflected in transportation and in access. Um, you know, this shows, the, this, the, the green line showed transportation that essentially stops abruptly at the city limits. Uh, the buses that roll through the streets of wealthy northern suburbs generally don't cross eight mile, right? So those that do uh, make the trip to downtown Detroit um, uh, you know, uh, but a, an old city ordinance uh, prohibits them from picking people up in, in Detroit. And the same thing goes for when they come back to get those suburbanites and drive them downtown. They're not supposed to be bringing new passengers in. Those things are, are undergoing some changes right now, but few of those urban or suburban buses that come through, they only come once every half hour or so, which is not a great frequency for transit. Um, but three in five Detroiters work outside the city, right? Um, nearly 75% of the people who work in the city come from the suburbs. Like it or not, the housing market is regional, uh, the jobs market is regional, and the transportation network really should be regional. So you might have uh, uh, participated in something that came up for a, a vote in 2016. 
uh, RTA was proposing um, a plan, and they were asking the voters in the region to support an additional tax that would justify big investments in, uh, in regional transportation, including uh, BRT on corridors uh, that would extend from Detroit, um, reopening a commuter rail line that uh, would travel between uh, Ann Arbor and Detroit, and extending a grid of 11 cross-county uh, cross connectors, uh, high-frequency uh, buses, uh, you know, around the region. So, so that didn't happen, you know? And I think that uh, that failure of that initiative uh, was really rough, especially coming on the heels of, the De of Detroit's declaration of bankruptcy. Because with the bankruptcy um, came, um, you know, uh, moves by the city and the Department of Transportation to cut the budget in half, forcing the department to lay off a whole bunch of bus drivers and also get rid of late night service. And so people who are having to do shift work, uh, and that was their only form of transportation, were really hard hit. So I think that was really kind of the nadir, the real low point in Detroit. But I'm happy to say that from many perspectives, things are on the upswing, that a lot of that late night service has now been restored. And one of the cool things that, uh, that Detroit did is partner with one of these new mobility companies, Lyft, uh, to offer rides, uh, seven-dollar rides, ride credits that would get people to uh, a Connect 10 route. So Connect 10 is a service that now runs 10 lines, uh, you know, uh, overnight, relatively high frequency around uh, the city. You can see the map, uh, and not just with that, but with uh, new buses that have air conditioning, that have Wi-Fi, you know, and this is intended to. Uh, to really try to get people to return uh, to the bus system. And it's using a lot of, this, uh, of the uh, uh, technology uh, that's become available in the last five years or so in particular. And Detroit is actually doing it ahead of a lot of other cities, bigger cities, cities that have a lot more money in their transportation budget. And as a result, uh, what's happened is that transit uh, service is improving uh, more on-time performance, and the ridership is growing. One of very few cities in the whole country that can make that claim. Uh, they've adopted the use of apps that can help you plan your trip uh, using many different modes, connecting, ride hailing, with transit, with scooters, with bikes, um, and also paying for those trips with one app, which makes it so much more convenient for folks. You could still definitely use higher frequency, uh, uh, more rapid service, um, you know, but it's definitely looking great for bus. So, so what about those scooters? Um, Detroit is one of 100 or more cities in the U.S. where uh, these rented electronic scooters have suddenly appeared, um, you know, in, in just the last two years, right? Uh, they. They, they appeared, no question about it, faster than any city's ability to respond to it, right? So um, the, the media has seen scooters uh, in a lot of different ways, but a lot of places have been very unhappy, you know, with how they've appeared, uh, and, and very unhappy with the lack of any kind of coordination. Um, I have to say that uh, I think many of the scooter companies have some regret about how they've just shown up. But think of it from their perspective. Um, you know, a lot of the scooter companies um, are essentially technology companies uh, fueled by venture capital, and a lot of them have now uh, been part of uh, uh, an initial public offering, meaning they, that people can buy stock in these companies, and now there's a lot of pressure for them to perform. So for them, they're just thinking very short term about market share. And so they want to be in places, as many places as possible, with as many riders as, as possible. And here in Detroit, you know, it's, um, uh, it's been really mixed, the reception that they've gotten. Some people are absolutely using scooters and where it's convenient. You know, some people have said, hey, when that bus is slow, you know, I can hop on a scooter and still get to work. Uh, but because it, they rolled out without 
any citizen input for the most part and very few regulation, a lot of people are also saying, well, who is this transportation for? No one talked to me about it. Uh, no one asked me if uh, this is something I can use or want to use. You know, so what about that? Um, Micromobility was nowhere. The, these scooters were nowhere um, in 2017. They basically appeared in cities beginning in 2018. And in the first year that they appeared, they, people made 84 million trips on them. So think of all the bike share programs in the country. Yours, right, MoBikes, but also uh, all the bike share uh, systems in the whole country, docked. And for a while, we had dockless. Remember that? That, that, that was about a minute that those dockless bikes were around. Um, but still, um, more trips by scooter than all of those other uh, public bike share programs and dockless bike programs. And that's just in their first year. So that growth has really continued. And so um, you know, it's, a, it's something that, that's appealing to someone, right? It's appealing to some people, right? Uh, and certainly, in a lot of neighborhoods, um, who's riding them is actually really different than people who are using bike share programs. Uh, it's, they've been younger. Uh, there have actually been more women riding. A lot of the bikes were being uh, ridden in many cities mostly by men. Um, and uh, more people of color have been using them. They're cheaper. They have been cheaper to use to get around. But let's be clear, scooters are the tip of the iceberg. New mobility is a whole bunch of other things. Um, and some of those things, I think, really have a lot of promise. Remember what I said about cars and how inefficient our transportation system is? There's a lot more to it than just that. Um, you know, right now, uh, technology has the potential to make our trips more integrated so that we can imagine taking a lot of different modes on a single trip to get from point A to point B um, and having the flexibility to do it, right? We could also pay for a lot of different trips, maybe with a single payment, and people can start to bundle trips together so that when it's off-peak for transit service um, and there aren't a lot of riders, you could offer steeply discounted fares for people to use the bus or use the queue line um, because the marginal cost of a new rider when they're already running the service is almost zero. And you might be able to price things in a way that you get a lot more people making those choices. It means that you, you can get by with less ownership, whether that's owning a bike, owning a car, owning a scooter. And you could pick the particular vehicle that actually works with your, with your trip, however long it is or what the purpose is. You know, whether you're, uh, you're, you're, you're fine with keys, wallet, phone, and out the door, or whether you're hauling... Uh, kids, hauling uh, parents, hauling groceries. Uh, you've got cargo, so you need a different kind of a vehicle. With mobility as a service, which is what, this, what new mobility also provides, is that uh, you could buy as much or as little mobility as you actually need. So instead of buying 100% of a car that you only drive 5% of the time, you could, you could still use a car, but you would use it only when you needed it and only pay for it when you need it. And you could take as many different modes and connections as made sense. And different people would make different choices. You might plan your trip based on uh, the price. You know, you need low-cost transportation, so you pick uh, an inexpensive trip. Maybe you're in an urgent need to get somewhere. It's an emergency, so now you want speed. That might be a different mode that you would take. Uh, you get confused by a lot of connections, and there's the chance for delay. So you want as few connections as possible. That's also a way you could plan your trip. Maybe you have a favorite route. Maybe there's stores you like to go by or, or a part of the city you like to particularly be in. You could use that as a reason to pick your trip. Um, another thing that we could have in the future is on-demand access. Let's think about this. The thing about bus service right now is that it's fixed in place. It doesn't move off the, off the planned routes. And it's on a schedule, even if it doesn't meet the schedule all the time. Uh, it's ostensibly on a schedule. And you can't have the bus change its schedule to fit, to fit your needs. But in the future, you might be able to access uh, services as you need them. And not necessarily even on fixed routes, but on routes that are specific for you and maybe a small group of other people who are also going more or less in the same direction. Um, so the routes could be uh, flexible, and so could the schedule. Um, 
Detroit is lucky in having a couple of different groups that are particularly focused on some of these issues. I really like uh, True, right? The Transportation Riders Union. And they even have a page on their website that talks about why it's important to engage in this new mobility conversation, what's at stake, how things could really get better in Detroit for transportation if people were demanding uh, of those things. Because really, um, you know, instead of all the trips being taken by car, uh, and, and really for Detroit, uh, Detroit has one of the lowest rates of household car ownership in the country. Um, and they're with cities like DC, New York, Boston, San Francisco, that have lots and lots of other options, lots of transit service, and, uh, and, a, and a lot of high density parts of the city where walking is super convenient. Detroit has less of that walking convenience, but yet your rates of car ownership are really, really low. So that really, as a practical matter, means a lot of people are kind of stranded without a lot of choices. So bringing in alternatives to cars that could really provide a lot of different choices is very exciting. And even if you're a big lover just of transit, think about all the different ways you might be able to get more quickly and easily to transit. Because the, the, the transit, um, not just in Detroit, but in a lot of cities, is often very good on a few high frequency, uh, uh, higher speed lines, and it's very meandering, very, um, very uh, less reliable, much less frequent in a heck of a lot of other places. And if there were easier, more direct ways to get people to those high frequency, high speed, reliable lines, uh, people might be very much better served by the, by the transit that they have. Because uh, transportation is really about access. You know, it's, it's a th it's a, transportation is essentially a Band-Aid on what is a spatial mismatch, where people are versus where they want to be. Um, one of the things that Detroit has been doing in a very promising way the last few years is really looking at na the neighborhoods in Detroit and saying, how can we actually improve access within people's neighborhoods? Because only a few of the trips, of the dozen or so trips a household makes every day, 15% uh, of the trips are work trips. The rest of the trips are really for all kinds of other needs, for groceries, right? For drug stores, for services for all kinds of other things, and those trips could be very local. They could easily be walk trips, but only if you put those services in neighborhoods, if you have the zoning uh, that allows them to go into neighborhoods. And in a lot of places, um, because of the changing nature of work and how many people are in the gig economy, even in neighborhoods that are entirely residential, there's often a small office building worth of people at home every day. Uh, working from home, who would love to access services in their neighborhoods, retail in their neighborhoods, gathering places in their neighborhoods. So putting people and places close together is a totally great strategy and, and, and one that Detroit is pr pursuing. The other one is the one we've been talking about, how you connect people with mobility services that are affordable, that are sustainable, um, and that are, I can't even see the last part, safe, safe for people. Um, and the access is, is, is important. I really want to stress that. I mean, uh, studies have shown that access to transportation is one of the most important factors for, uh, for economic mobility, for, for, for rising out of poverty, right? So, so to, to, have, you know, to have the opportunity to change that access for lots and lots of people uh, is very, very exciting. But let me emphasize that right now it's a potential that could go either way. It could actually make things worse and not better. Uh, it's certainly promising, but if, it, if every company acts on its own just to gain market share and to just uh, be able to say to Wall Street, I've got a bunch of new customers, and it's not part of a system that anyone is kind of guiding, uh, the, the benefits uh, that, that I talked about aren't going to be realized. Um, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, already there are cars that, uh, that just circle. We think about Uber, Lyft, uh, some of these other services, half of the time or more, uh, because no one's really regulating how many drivers enter the market, they aren't, they aren't on a trip. They're sitting around waiting or they're deadheading. They're coming back from wherever they were and they don't have a passenger. 
Um, Uber and Lyft added uh, almost 6 million miles in the nine largest cities relative to the period of time before the services were introduced. Some of those, uh, of those miles, they were carrying people, and maybe that enabled some people to give up a car, but a lot of those trips, they were just empty. Uh, trips can cannibalize and undermine transit. 50% um, of the ride hail trips in New York City, uh, surveys say would have otherwise been made by transit. So that would be terrible. That would be an awful outcome. Um, and another issue is that a lot of this is premised on access to the digital economy, on access to data and broadband. Uh, and Detroit is one of the uh, most extreme cases in the nation in terms of a lack of access uh, to broadband at home. Um, and if you are low income, uh, the number of those households without broadband is, uh, is over 60%. So that's something that absolutely has to be fixed. This is a, a, a map of the digital divide. You've got some really great people working in Detroit that do amazing maps. I got kind of went down the rabbit hole uh, looking at all the amazing maps that, that have been produced. But a lot of them tell a similar story about the disparity in the city and how uneven uh, certain uh, uh, access is, whether it's to, uh, to jobs, to grocery stores, to uh, the digital economy, um, th these are all issues that are going to have to be addressed. Uh, that's why it's kind of cool that the uh, new Connect 10 buses have Wi-Fi on them, so you can uh, uh, be able to, to, to get access uh, without having to use your own uh, cellular data to, uh, to do that. So the future of mobility could really look like um, uh, something that cities and community organizations uh, lead uh, by engaging with all the different mobility providers. And instead of guessing at who's going to be riding a bus or who's going to be needing uh, uh, one or more kinds of services, you would be able to call. Uh, you'd be able to say, I'm looking to ride a bus, or uh, you'd have up-to-the-minute information on, on who has been on the bus uh, in real time. So you kind of have a sense, a snapshot of what the demand really is. Um, and that what is part of the transportation supply is suddenly many, many more things. Not just public transit, not just ride share and ride hail, uh, not just car sharing, uh, but, but scooters and bikes and bike sharing and more things are coming all the time. Electric um, uh, motorcycles, mopeds are now hitting cities everywhere that are also shared that you don't have to own. Electric bikes are becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, so it, it's, it's entirely possible that um, the future of mobility could look extremely different with lots and lots of choices, but not if cities and citizens are not part of the conversation. I mean, basically, the public right-of-way is the operating system. And guess what? That is owned by the city. You know, none of these services can operate if cities didn't give access uh, to, to do that. So that's a really strong uh, uh, position to be in. Uh, and, and up till now, cities were not sufficiently aware of kind of what was going on to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, we should do this in a very different way. Uh, but they are starting to say that now, either by changing the rules, um, and, and, and I think a lot of companies expect their initial operating permissions to not be forever or permanent. Uh, and a lot of cities are changing the rules now that they have some sense of the impact and also a better sense of what the future could be. Um, and it's also true that right now, all of these companies think that they have to be profitable. Well, nothing in transportation in our country is unsubsidized. The roads are subsidized, right? Um, that, that drivers in cars do not pay for the roads. They're publicly subsidized. Transit is publicly subsidized. The bike share program, pub publicly subsidized. I mean, I think cities are very willing to pay for a whole range of transportation choices, some of it offered at market price, some of it subsidized, to get a system that works for everybody. And that's really the promise. And so cities are preparing for these coming changes um, in, in some important ways. And this is really why my organization, the New Urban Mobility Alliance, exists. We're based on something called the Shared Mobility Principles for Livable Cities, uh, 10 guiding principles that were put together by a group of nonprofit organizations that, that have now been endorsed by almost 160 organizations around the globe. 
um, advisors to cities, cities themselves, private sector companies, uh, academics, community advocates, designed to guide urban decision makers toward the best outcomes for all. Um, so the, the principles are up there, but they're about how we plan our cities uh, and our mobility together. We don't, we don't say, oh, technology is going to fix you know, our spatial mismatch. We're going to continue to sprawl and, and not worry about it. We prioritize people over vehicles. That's hugely important. Uh, we, we, want, we protect and promote equity. Right? We engage with stakeholders. I won't read them all uh, to you, but we're about public benefits via open data. So we can't have a single payment if the different companies don't share uh, what they call APIs, information about, uh, about payments. We can't plan trips seamlessly from mode to mode if they don't share information about the location of their vehicles and services so, so that we could have that seamless system. So cities um, and these new mobility pr providers um, have a lot of goals that are actually aligned. And in their rush to get into cities, very few of these companies have stopped to say, wait a minute, uh, the city and I, the communities and I, we have a lot of things that potentially are, are very much in common. Like our market share grows if there's less auto ownership and people are taking more trips a different way. Uh, people are going to use our services more if it's safe to use them. So we have protected infrastructure, which cities also very much want, especially infrastructure that can do double duty, like maybe manage stormwater, right, uh, as we get more and more heavy rain. Uh, we want things to be safer. These vehicles move at, and, and can be controlled to move at very much lower speeds uh, so that, that people have safety. Uh, they also very much want cities to increasingly be cities of short trips because they're more likely to use one of these um, uh, of different tools that if, the, if the trips are short. So in Detroit, the average commute is more than 10 miles, which makes it uh, you know, in competition with cities like Nashville and Atlanta and Dallas, these Sunbelt cities. It's a very long commute for, uh, for older cities like, uh, like, like Detroit actually is. So the trips that are local trips, the ones that are actually easiest to change land use around in your neighborhood, those are the trips that can be made uh, short. Um, and what do cities have to gain? Uh, and, and what do new mobility providers have to gain if they were to work together? Less car traffic, less greenhouse gas emissions, less car ownership, um, more retail foot traffic, uh, more equitable, low-cost access, more market share. Um, I think also uh, uh, fewer negatives if you're looking to increase density. Um, so these are, these are important things. Um, and what's also interesting is that a lot of these companies like Uber and Lyft, they're buying more of the ecosystem. So they don't just, they're not just selling you car rides. So Uber has bought Jump who has bikes and scooters. So they have these short trips that they're also very interested in people taking. And they're willing to send a price signal to suggest if you're taking a short trip that maybe you use some other way of getting there. And it's a lot cheaper for them to provide a scooter or a bike, in many cases, than a car and a driver, right? Uh, same for Lyft. They uh, bought Motivate, which operates many of the bike share systems in the country. And we're seeing more and more of it. So, uh, we have private sector actors who are suddenly, for the first time, interested in um, all of these different options and, 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 and incentivized to help people pick the mode that really best matches the trip, including, like I said, about safe infrastructure, that uh, the majority of people um, uh, are, are frankly unwilling uh, to be in a street with mixed traffic with automobiles because they rightly fear for their safety. And, and, and of course, they, they would be. I mean, a lot of why SUVs are so popular is that car manufacturers have told everybody they're the safest. You can be safe inside the cocoon of this car, you know, and, and you owe it to your family, you owe it to your kids to be safe, even if everyone else is now more at risk. Whether it's a car or whether it's a pedestrian or a bicyclist, everyone else is much more likely to die because of the design, the way the design has changed for automobiles. 
So people are concerned about safety, um, and if we had safe infrastructure, a heck of a lot more people would find it easy and convenient uh, to use these alternative modes. Um, I think when RuPaul is talking about this, that we might have reached you know, a turning point, right? Uh, if RuPaul gets it, right, uh, we should be getting it too. And uh, uh, let, let me let, let this run for a second from the beginning, that essentially, you know, you're, you're familiar with seeing a street uh, filled with cars. Um, here it is, 200 people in 177 cars. Here's what they look like without their cars. On bikes, on three buses, on one light rail train. You know, that's our opportunity. We can remake the rights of ways to provide the operating system for the, the, these new mobility options. And lots and lots of cities are really looking at how to reallocate and reimagine the right of way to make it safe to, and provide a lot more space for walking, for biking, for scooters, for buses, to give priority uh, to those transit trips so more and more people will be inclined to take them. And one of the interesting things that's happening is, uh, is that, you know, Whatever you want to say, whether you're annoyed by scooters on the sidewalk uh, or, 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 uh, you know, or bikes being parked haphazardly, uh, they've created a real opportunity as cities are seizing the reins uh, to do this, to provide this, uh, this infrastructure. They're also finding all kinds of interesting places in the street right-of-way to put docks for bikes and for scooters that actually make it safer for pedestrians to cross. They're narrowing the distance to cross the street, and they're getting rid of the parked cars that were, a lot of them SUVs, that you can't, made it very hard in terms of visibility for cars to see other cars or to see bikes or pedestrians. With these very much lower, kind of more transparent things at the corners, uh, it's, it's safer for everybody. So um, NACTO is an organization that works with uh, city transportation officials. And, uh, and I think I, I couldn't agree more with what they're saying. Equitable uh, transportation is all of these things. Convenient, reliable, efficient, safe, affordable, connected to other transportation options, planned with and for communities. So um, my clarion call to you is to get involved. This is a, a moment. Um, and we're not going to get the transportation, the access, the opportunity that we need and deserve if we don't get engaged in this conversation about what's coming to our cities. Thank you. I'd love if there's time. Is there time for questions or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe just a couple quick questions, and I'll be around after. I'm happy to talk to anyone who'd like to talk. Um, Hi, um, I'm Janine. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting to see what you're planning on, what the idea about micromobility or transportation is in general. Um, it's just a question. There was one slide where you were saying um, that um, the usage of the public transport decreases because of Uber and all this kind of um, um, tra transport, transportation things. And on the other hand, you say you want to make transportation like a priority lane and all that kind of stuff. To me, it seems as if um, this one, the, the public transport declines the usage of it. How can you make it still affordable and accessible to the people because uh, the other ones are coming and taking over? This is one question. The other thing is what's really striking me is um, you've been talking about a lot of stuff which is really important to m mobility, but I haven't read or seen or listened to one a single moment of inclusion. So what about the people who are not um, able to ride a scooter or a bike or something like that? And also the younger people, so how do they navigate through the cities? That's it. Um, sure, those are good questions. And I would just say that, uh, that, that the, the, the cannibalization of transit is a perfect example. You could say to, a, uh, uh, to these uh, new mobility providers that want to operate in your city on your, in your public realm, you can't operate if you're cannibalizing transit. So you have to operate in a way that you're not uh, shifting trips from transit to this. That might mean you have to raise your prices so that there's a price differential. It might mean that you have a specific program to use 
uh, you know, uh, Uber or Lyft to get people to transit, you know, offer a very attractive price to get people to transit stations. Uh, what I'm saying is that cities can decide what the rules of the game are, citizens can decide what the rules of the game are, and that the people with the most at stake should be the people most at the table. And that's lower income folks who don't have cars, and that's 40% of households in Detroit. That's really who should be sitting down at the table, sitting down with the city before we, we even have a conversation with these providers about what should be getting better, right? And, and, and what, should, what should be increasing and what should be decreasing, right, as we look at uh, moving into the future of mobility. I think maybe just one more question, because I'm going, running over. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your presentation. Uh, really amazing. Um, so my name is Fatima, I'm a community organizer here in the city, and I really hear you on you know, the integration, right? Uh, the thing is, uh, probably the most feasible way for that to happen is on an app, right? Um, or something digital. And there's a lot of mistrust around the digital. I mean, like, aside from the fact that we're a huge digital divide, um, it's being, it's, there are steps t being taken right now to bridge that gap, but no steps are being taken to address why so many people in our communities are very mistrusting of it. And so we put in all of this on an app, it's just like, I don't want, who's gonna track my, me going to and from places? Like, it's basically all consolidated in one location and can be easily, you know, subpoenaed or accessed to by ICE or by other government entities. And so a lot of folks in our communities are like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm gonna use it the old school way, I'm gonna just show up at the bus stop. Don't give me a, an app, right? So aside from digital, what are other ways where we can make this more accessible um, in terms of getting this information out to, the, to our communities? Um, so I think that privacy is a, is a huge issue and what happens with the data is a huge issue and again, the cities ha can, ha can say a lot about setting down the conditions of that. But it's also possible, especially on the trip planning side, for this information to be available in other places, in stores, right? In the lobby of your apartment building, right? At the library, uh, at public buildings. You know, there are all kinds of places where you could access this information to plan a trip that don't have to be just in your phone. Uh, payment is a little bit harder, especially across platforms without an app. But I think those are the kinds of questions you could challenge. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're, these solutions are being invented right now. It's, it's totally reasonable to say, I need a solution, right, that people can access that won't involve, you know, the permanent uh, storage or transmission of their personal information. So I think those are great questions, but I, I guess what I'm just saying is engage. Like it's not, it's, it's moving. And it's gonna, and, and people are proposing solutions that are not inclusive, that are not engaging the people who are most affected. Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have two ways that things could go. We're at a crossroads. Everything could get better because our transportation costs are ridiculous. In Detroit, insurance, you know, the, the, the cost, the, it's become the, the, the step you have to take to enter the economy, to own a car. That is the most racist, regressive thing that, that you could do in a place. You're making it po impossible for people to access. That's why I showed the numbers about other, other cities, other places around the globe who, where they drive half as much as we do because they're, they have more equality in, in other places. And they've provided options so that people don't have to use a private automobile to get everywhere they need to go. So this is, this is the moment to say, all of these things offer less expensive choices. How do we get these options to the people who need them the most? And how do we design them with them so they serve the people who need these options the most? And that conversation needs to start right now. Thank you. We have time for two more short oh, questions. OK, you sorry. Sure. Okay. Your, your talk was so stimulating. I just wanted to tell you I brought an example to cover design and your question, which is, is for ownership. So I'm an automotive person. I bought all the auto companies. Whereas in China, I found the world's best design product, the Red Dot Luminary, which is a German award, the Nobel Prize of Design, and seven others, because it folds. It's 34 pounds. I've driven it over 1,000 miles since the auto show. So first thing is design and innovation for some. If you're handicapped, you're not doing this. If you weigh over 220 pounds, you're not doing this. If you're six miles, seven miles away, you're on the edge. 
But for a big chunk, because there's no one size fits all, things like this should be figured out in the United States. And that takes government support, number one. And if you think about tax credits for EVs, uh, ownership, it's the fox and the chicken coop. All the e-scooter e companies care about is making $15 to $30 an hour renting you a disposable product. And that's very expensive. And if you own it, which is why auto companies got into leasing so you could you know, own it or, or long-term lease, then the economic shift to the underrepresented. How much does that cost? $1,500 in the USA, 2,000 in Europe. And it goes 20 miles on three cents of electricity, which is free. And it's unbelievably good. It's a Tesla type battery. So, and that, I'm not doing a commercial, but it's an example. I think it's a great example. And to answer the other question that was that was written, the because the the things that are we ca now call scooters were never intended That's for the in, the intensity of the use that they're getting. They're they're not lasting very long. They're not as safe. So they every iteration has a new design. I mean, in some ways, there's a, already starting to be a convergence. Three wheels, seats. Uh, I mean, the motorized wheelchair is a form of a scooter um, that doesn't have necessarily the capacity or the speed uh, that, that, that scooters have, but these things are all converging, and that's certainly a great option. A lot of people are, are, are really betting on electric bikes, and I'll confess I just bought my own electric bicycle um, this last month, and I do totally love it. Uh, but I think the price will come down as more gets manufactured, and your very own hometown GM is making these amazing e-bikes, but only in Europe and only for sale in Europe. So I'm trying to persuade them to bring them here, right? And, and, and let, let Detroiters be able to access them. Maybe, uh, maybe a bike share to start, uh, because you know who would ever buy a bike that you hadn't had a chance to ride, right? So uh, that might be a great way to introduce it to a lot of people. But thanks for your comment. And then last question. Hi, I've been a bus rider here in Detroit for about 35 years. Um, originally living in the burbs and uh, wound up losing a job moving into the city so I've been living in the city and without a car for about close to 15. Um, so when I look for housing I always look for a transit line nearby. It's a, it's a requirement. Um, one of the things that's happened in the past two months was that DDOT was having public input meetings. The way that this was happening was they would come in, they'd talk about something, um, kind of pass the microphone around, we would say, give some suggestions, and nothing really happened with the suggestions. There was listening, but no hearing that happened. And so then they decided that they were going to make the public input meetings quarterly. Well, um, the activists in the city kind of pushed back and said, listen, you need to have monthly input meetings. And some of the best people that were actually trying to do their best to listen and hear ha are no longer with DDOT. And we need to ask them, could they please improve their listening and doing to serve the public? And that includes our uh, handicapped people. I shouldn't say handicapped, I'm sorry, disabled, um, that are, uh, in serious need of support. Um, there's only so many uh, chair locations inside a bus. And as a bike rider, we've only got three, three racks on the DDOT buses and two on the Smart. On my way here, one of the racks for the DDOT bus, one of the slots was broke. So we need maintenance to actually look, really look at the bus because the driver's typically not going out and actually looking at a bike rack. Yeah, I think those are really good points, and I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about engagement, uh, you know, there's no point in having it if you're not going to use the information that you're getting to, to make different decisions. Uh, I'm kind of impressed with the voice recognition technology that they're using today. It makes it kind of easy, right, to transcribe what it is people are saying with decent accuracy, depending on how fast you talk, I guess. But anyway, thank you all very much. Thanks for your comments, and uh, uh, have a... <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. All right, well, uh, uh, I'm even more impressed then. Thank you.